everyone. You're listening to the Simple Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Dan, from the Simple Electronics YouTube channel. And with me today, I've got a very special guest, Eric from the MKME Lab. How are you, Eric? I'm well, Dan. How are you? I'm I'm pretty good. Um, Eric is in Ontario. So, um, Eric, how does it feel to not be in a heat wave for the first time in like four weeks? Yeah, it's back today and yesterday again. I think we'll be in the 30s again today. So... It's oh. still still warm. I spoke too soon because here we're just, I think we're in the low 20s and it's raining all day, but I guess it's coming back for us too. That sucks. <laughs> it's not over yet. Damn. Well, um, like I've been lurking in your YouTube channel for quite a while now, probably close to a year. So I've had the chance to see quite a few interesting stuff on your channel. But for those people that are listening that don't know you, uh, can you explain a little bit what you, who you are and what you're about? Sure. Well, uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm Eric. I run the Make Me Lab channel. You can find, uh, just search Make Me Org is the username. Also, the website is makeme.org. And on the main Make Me Lab channel, I do basically share anything, any electronics projects, um, any projects that I've got on the go at the time. It's always been sort of a an ongoing diary for me of just uh, chronicling the different projects that I do and in hopes that it can help someone else someday. Yeah. And that's kind of a understatement because uh, I see some of your projects have a very noble cause. Um, one of which is the rescue project. Uh, can you talk about a little bit what that project is and then I'll prompt you some more stuff I'd like to know. Sure. Uh, rescue was, I believe my, third Hackaday Prize entry. Basically, Rescue is a, a ESP8266 receiver. And when I was playing, when I started playing with the ESP8266 boards, I, I was kind of alarmed about the promiscuous mode and how underutilized it was to just sniff for traffic around you. And I always thought that could be useful. So one day I tacked one to the bottom of one of my RC aircraft, one of my INAV um, autonomous aircraft, and found out that I could sniff from cell phones, sniff for cell phones from the air. And in a country like where we live here in Canada, people get lost a lot in pretty remote wilderness. So I fleshed out things a little bit further and made it into a, a standalone unit for a ground-based high-gain Yagi. Uh, version which you could use for ground searches and then ones that you could put on drones or aircraft in the air and even mount in light aircraft like Cessnas permanently and gave it away open source and send it off to the rest of the uh, Hackaday Prize. So like I can assume what the motivation is but but could you tell us what your motivation was for actually uh, thinking of this and putting it into play? Uh, just mostly because I hear of these people going missing so often, and I thought, well, I could do something about that. It happened in our area. One of the a local men was lost um, uh, just outside of his house, not far from here, and they searched for him for a week before they, they found him right underwater, just not far from his car. A very sad story, but I always wondered whether there was situations like that that people are close by that I could detect um, by just finding their cell phone. Uh, I'm a, I'm partial to open source, make the world better projects, as you can see on my website. Yeah, I, I agree with the open source mentality. I had this conversation with uh, Big Clive, and he was a little bit sour that um, corporations will pick up open source projects, do very minor changes, and then sell it to the mass market. But I, I think... For me personally, that's worth the risk. Um, you know, it, it's just it's worth it because those who cannot do it, those who don't have the skills to put something together, will buy a pre-made solution. But for everybody else, there is a free solution out there, or you know, cheaper solution out there. So, I'm a big fan of uh, of open source for sure. Me as well. Actually, I I totally agree with Big Clive there because. I do have a history in that department too with a previous Hackaday entry that actually won a prize. And I, uh, I approached a manufacturer about utilizing it um, in their tech for free, of course, and they wouldn't even 
they wouldn't give it the time of day because it was no longer protectable because it was in the public domain. It was, wow. a, yeah, it was a bit of a sad thing because I had that, that was the gas sensor for emergency workers project. And it was the largest manufacturer of that equipment. And yeah, they, they wouldn't give it the time of day until I found someone who would actually give me a straight answer. And it was because it was public domain at that time. If they can't patent it, they don't want it. That's, that's quite unfortunate because that's, that would be a life-saving device. So that's, it's really sad that it's, it's profits before, you know, humanities. Big business. It is what it is, right? But at least it's out there for people like us to make and use if we want. Yeah. And I mean, if I had more, um, more free time on my hand, I would probably be making such devices for, uh, for the people around me. Like I'd probably be donating it to my own, uh, fire services, right? So it just, Absolutely. it is what it is. I wish, you know, I wish I could have these, uh, these life changing ideas, you know, uh, most of my ideas are, are pretty garbage to start with and then they fall, they fall apart even through the execution. So, you know, I commend, I really, um, I'm really happy that there's people like you constantly thinking of these things and putting them into action. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I just build from what other people have done before me, which is one of the primary drivers that got me into open source was the fact that other people were leading the way. The Arduino movement really helped. That really helped turn the corner between basic electronics and microcontroller use. And I never saw anything as my own. It's all built on something that the community has done or some piece of what they have done first. So it's a, it's definitely a community effort. Oh, for sure. And I think that's a big motivator for me to continue to make YouTube uh, content is that this is my way of giving back to the community. You know, I would argue that it's not as big of a contribution as, as some others are, but at the very least, if I can show people that, that someone like me can do electronics, that means someone like them can do electronics and the community grows because growth in the community is the only way to improve the community, really. Absolutely. And uh, just some of you that are wondering uh, why rescue is so important, a project like that is so important, is because Canada's wilderness is unbelievably big. It's like insanely big. Like go take um, a satellite view of Western Ontario, just, just for an example, and zoom in so that you can have about 10 kilometers on your screen and see how far you have to scroll before you even see a man-made structure. It is ridiculously huge. So projects like this uh, could mean life and death for you know hikers or campers or people trying to experience the the wilderness so it's a very it's a very valid thing so it's nice that these uh, mass market you know chinese microcontrollers really have upped the game in what we can build at home and have an impact you know other than inside our labs yep it sure uh, it works better than i ever anticipated that's for sure i was a little shocked with the initial results if you check out the one video where i, I had to find a way to test it and and it's hard to test it in real world with humans in a situation where you'd want to find them where they're far enough away so i used the the beach bluffs here uh, in town where i live where all the tourists had come to enjoy the beach and i was able to get a good distance and when I started hitting 100 targets uh, sniffed, I knew that I had something from probably about 300 meters, 400 meters away. So the system worked. Yeah, that is a that's a, a big that's a big difference. I see you fly drones too. You have uh, some quadcopters and some fixed wings. Where did that uh, that hobby come from? I've been into RC all my life. My father and I used to fly RC aircraft when I was quite young. Back then it was gas powered and nickel cadmium electrics, uh, pretty, pretty low tech compared to day, today's stuff. And uh, a few years ago I saw FPV drones hit the scene or quadcopters and I wanted to give it a try and I was hooked pretty quick. It's kind of fun to, fun to play and it's a good relaxing hobby and you get to build and play with the cool electronics. And then the fixed wing came back as a result of that. And then I got into the autopilot stuff with iNav and that is, it just blew my mind what you can do with 
just an F4 microcontroller now. It works quite well. Was the was your resurgence uh, into the RC hobby at all powered by flight test videos? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've watched flight tests since well, since the dawn of flight test. I think I've been subscribed to them since day one. And uh, yeah, it's it was pretty cool. I never got big into the foam board, but I always enjoyed watching their videos. I made a Versa um, from their designs, and that was a great wing to beat the heck out of. But uh, yeah, they, they kept my interest. Even in the long winter months here in Canada, it's fun to watch flight test. I have a few aircraft here, but my piloting skills are absolutely terrible. And um, I was starting to move up and uh and get bigger and bigger uh, aircraft but then canada changed the laws a couple of years ago and then i just I, it, it became a bother so i i just i sold off the bigger stuff and and now i'm more interested in the sub 250 gram stuff so i'm gonna try to get back into it but um it's a it's hard to set some time aside to uh to go out and fly when i really should be you know down here making videos considering the amount i've been putting out lately is like none <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I have my quadcopter and a fixed wing, my mini AR wing in the back of my car for the last two weeks, zero flights. I haven't flown either in months actually, but I've been trying for weeks and it just never happens. For the record, I'm a horrible FPV drone pilot. Uh, I'm not very a good pilot in any respect, but I enjoy it. So we're not going to see you shooting gaps through the branches of trees and stuff? No, I'll never be Steel Davis, but I do. Uh, <laughs> I do enjoy a flight. It's it's still fun for me. I just don't make enough time to get good at it, or my old brain just doesn't pick it up. I'm not sure which. I, I don't. I'm not sure if I should be co uh, publicly calling him out, but I noticed that uh, Chad Capper, which uh, people you probably know, but people probably don't know that he's the uh, one of the founders of Flight Test. He he actually subscribes to me on YouTube, which was quite the honor. Yeah, he's actually subscribed to me as well. <laughs> nice. If you check out his channel, he did a video not that long ago on on brand building and stuff. That's that's truly good. Chad is he is a a very underrated individual. He has a lot of knowledge in his head to build those brands. Oh yeah, and and I think he's he also has a singular talent on picking the the on camera talent because uh, uh, picking. Uh, Josh to Josh and Josh to host those early uh, flight test videos really was part of the the success of flight test as well I think absolutely 100% agree so I also noticed switching gears a little bit here without uh, without the really good um, segues I know that's a crime <laughs> um, so you're in Ontario I'm in Ontario uh, I've been looking at a laser cutter and you have a laser cutter. Do you have a cheaper source for these laser cutters or did you literally shell out $800 for a laser cutter that Americans can get for like 300 bucks? No, I got it. Uh, the K40 I got was from uh, eBay and I got it out of, uh, it was Northern New York state that, and there was a Texas one that were both the same price. And that was pre COVID by, a very short time and I believe it worked out to about 400 and some Canadian at that time which was oh my god ridiculous you couldn't build it for the price that I got it for there was yeah. shipping on top of it but it was it was minor no customs problems nothing it was shocking I would be all over that so I'm <laughs> yeah because I'm shopping now there's you're you're relatively close to Toronto at least compared to me and yep. there are a few sellers in Toronto, and it looks like it's about 690 bucks at the moment, which is the lowest I've seen them in a long time. But uh, yeah, that price tag sure is prohibitive for, for a laser cutter, at least I think. At that price, I think it's still worth it. Even, even if it's a bottom-of-the-line K40 that needs the upgrades, the upgrades are super cheap and super easy for people that do hobbies like us. And... The laser cutter was one of the tools that I drastically underestimated. I bought it more or less because I didn't have one yet and wanted to play. And I, although I don't use it every day, when I do need to use it for making um, like display panels or I made the rescue air cases, uh, cutting acrylic is just shockingly good. The, what it can do is 
is I'm so far behind because my imagination hasn't caught up. It is a wonderful tool. Stop, stop. I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> get in the car. You can get there today. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much they would charge for local pickup. That's a good point because that shipping that, uh, I mean, shipping in Canada is insane. The shipping that must be at least 60, 70 bucks. I might be able to save 70 bucks on that. So that's, Ooh, that's tempting. For sure. Uh, it's tempting. a gr- it's a great tool. I I'm really happy I got it. I'm even happier I got it at the price I did and when I did. But it is a wonderful tool to have in the shop. Okay, so you're talking about upgrades. So what kind of upgrades do those basic K40s need? Uh, mine needed the air assist. The air assist is the number one. So you have to give it some source of moving air to to help with the cut. The second is the the bed itself. Get rid of the bed that comes in it if it still has that silly clamp piece of garbage thing. Just throw it out and put anything in there that's flat. And then I switched that with an adjustable one. Uh, it's in my most recent video not too long ago. And added a an ammeter is pretty much necessary to uh, so you can tell whether you're overdriving the laser or not because the, the control panel doesn't doesn't give you good control. And if you do overdrive them for too long, it will burn out the tube. So what would you say, like with, uh, with like how much do these upgrades cost? Cause I was looking to build my own laser cutter, but just the expanded metal for the bed, uh, you know, that kind of honeycomb stuff was quite pricey. Yeah. That was, I think $50 or so, which was slightly ridiculous, but you can also go with the first version I used, which is just a uh, a great style that I got at the local Rona. Uh, not not ideal, but works. As mm. long as it's flat, as long as it's flat and has as many holes in it as possible. Uh, ideally, you don't want reflections coming back up through, but it's not the end of the world if you just keep the cover closed. I feel you could probably even uh, paint the grate black, and so you know you probably blast off a layer of it. But every once in a while, you could just repaint it. Yep, you can. The problem is, is the it scorches the backside of your work material that you're cutting. That's that's the problem with any surface area that the laser's contacting is it will burn the backside of your cut. So, the more holes, the less surface area, the better. But mm-hmm. basically, anything goes. That's why that honeycomb stuff is so perfect. But I'm sure you could find lots of alternatives out there. Oh man, this is not going well for my wallet so far. <laughs> yeah, as as for the the air assist, it's nothing. Some aquarium tubing, some vinyl tubing, and you 3D print the nozzle itself. And you, you can also 3D print the drag chain for it, or you can buy one. I bought one from Amazon because it was like 10 bucks. It's way easier than printing it. I'm just looking around my shop here. I have a 3D printer. I have another 3D printer that I'm actually designing and building do i need a laser cutter you know what i'll leave it to the comment section so the comment section can tell me if it's a yes or a no because obviously you're pro um i know um i know uh, another maker which is someone i I speak to a lot he's pro laser as well so i'll leave it to the comment section you guys let me know should i get the laser cutter or no perfect and uh preferably if you're a patreon because uh it's expensive (laughs) (laughs) So what kind of 3D printer do you use? Um, my daily driver now is the Anycubic i3 Mega. I've been using that for years just because I don't do a thing. I hit start. I don't even look at the first layer. I come back. The print is perfect and never stuck to the ultra base. It's just absolutely best printer ever. And my other larger format is the CR10 original. And before that is one that you've never heard of was a solid doodle was a Kickstarter, one of the first 3d printers ever. <laughs> you, I, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you must be doing well in your, in your day job because you've got a lot of toys here. <laughs> yeah. Day job's pretty good. It keeps me busy. Like, yeah. Do you, do you have time to, to do, I mean, where do you find the time to develop like an open source rescuing platform? Like, I only have two part-time jobs at the moment and I'm like dying. (laughs) I don't sleep much is the answer I give people. It's, (laughs) it's easier now. I've throttled back the day job from in the eighties of hours to into the down into the sixties and less sometimes. So, uh, 
there's there's a lot of hours at night that people use for watching TV. I don't watch TV, so I build things and watch YouTube. Uh, it's just I because I see your your stuff is very impressive. So you have um, uh, an Arduino interface for like a flight sim, for example. How long did you spend on building that? Oh, the Learjet. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Lear was I think. Whew, I think that was eight or nine years. That's how the YouTube channel started, was documenting the builds of the, it's a one-to-one Bombardier Learjet 45. And yeah, I think it was panel by panel, one by one. Some of them CNC'd elsewhere in the world. There was a small group of us around the world that were building them. That was pre-Arduino. Uh, the Arduino actually came later. Um, I integrated a few panels that way in the first years of Arduino hitting the scene. But uh, yeah, eight or nine years on that one, it's decommissioned because it took up the entire room and heated up half of my house every time I ran it because it's six computers. Yeah, that's a bit ridiculous, I have to say. <laughs> it was it was slightly ridiculous, but oh, so fun. The problem was it actually became frustrating because of the amount of time the more I integrated, like basically all flight systems are integrated on that um, with the exception of the flight guidance computer. The rest were all fully functional and to do pre-flight and get airborne for any decent flight, like from from Charlie Yankee Golf Delta, my, my local airport to London International, it, you're looking at an hour and a half and that's only 14 minutes of actual flight time because all the rest of the pre-flight and stuff to get the darn thing airborne. So it was, and that's not including getting all of the six computers fired up and everything working. So yeah, it was, it was a big affair just to use it. (laughs) Do you have uh, actual flight time under your belt? Do you fly real planes? I was working on it. My father was a pilot and I was working on my private, um, my P star uh, when I got hired at my current, wind turbine day job and that put an end to that post haste so i got a paramotor actually and i didn't have time for that either so that's when i started building the lear instead to to fill the gap it worked Uh, good i'm sorry we we can't just we can't just okay we we can't just skip over all these things first of all wind turbine (laughs) day job yeah so design maintenance installation what what kind of area it started, I left it, I was in the automotive trade. Um, I'm still licensed uh, 310S here in Ontario and I guess Canada wide. I left that in 2006 and started wrenching on wind turbines as a technician. Uh, from there, I went to lead technician slash managerial role running a site for several years, then tech support then software, then software development. And now I look after software troubleshooting and dev for a good portion of our machines. (laughs) Okay. We need to go back one more, one more. So three, three, 10 S. So for people who don't know, that's, that's our automotive license here, Canada wide, except for Quebec because they have regional licensing. Um, So I'm also a three, 10 S, but you specifically said S. So you must've got your license after they split off the automotive from the truck and coach stuff. Yep. Yeah, it was just after, I believe. It was right right before the College of Trades fiasco started. So uh College of Trades was quite a bit after. I think the yeah. I think in the nineties you were getting your three ten S and T, so allowed to work on cars and trucks for those listening at home um at the same time and now and then they split them. Then recently we have this weird Ontario College of Trades, which they look after our our licensing, and the pitch was that there was going to be fewer unlicensed people working, <laughs> but uh, the next government got in, scrapped it as quick as possible, and so now we're still paying the same fees, but just for absolutely zero service. So, Absolutely. government, yay! <laughs> yeah, I was I was in for it was nine thousand hours for my apprenticeship. And I can't even remember how many years I was licensed before I left the trade. But basically, the the smartest move I ever made in my life was to get a trade and get into the automotive trade and learn the trade, get licensed. The second smartest thing I ever did was get out. Yeah, I would say if you're looking into a trade today, 
uh, and you don't mind the smells, I think plumbers are the way to go because I'm looking at the average wage of a plumber, or at least around here in Ontario, and it's it's something like 30 or 40 percent more than us uh, mechanics or they're technicians, but mechanics, so to speak. <laughs> and um, and they don't have to buy fifteen thousand dollars worth of tools to get started. So fifteen. Where did you live? Well, <laughs> that was I work so I, I work got... at a dealership, so I get to buy a specific uh, set of tools, and I don't have to, you know, I don't have to have all the blow molded cases in my toolbox, basically. I was in general repair, which has has its bonuses, but uh, the the rider I have on my house insurance to cover those tools is, yeah, a lot more than that. It's north of seventy. People don't understand how much money we spend on tools when I tell them that, you know, a basic, basic toolbox from Costco that won't last you very long is still like 800 bucks. <laughs> yeah, it's it's criminal and none of which was tax deductible. It was it was criminal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now, like, it's not uncommon in the trade to see people in ten thousand dollar toolboxes just empty, just toolbox. And yeah. Uh, and then you know a set of you know snap-on screwdrivers will send you send you back like four you know like two hundred and fifty dollars. A uh, snap-on ratchet with three eighths um, uh, sockets is like three hundred bucks. It's like it's insane the amount we spend on tools. It's ridiculous. Yep, but you got to have them, and they've got to be good to do the job. And the Mastercraft stuff just doesn't cut it. Those thick chrome sockets just don't fit in the places that the snap-on will. <laughs> Yeah, not quite. And uh, and Mastercraft, for those listening, is the Canadian tire brand, which is sort of like um, a quarter step up from a Harbor Freight type thing because we have a Harbor Freight too. It's Princess Auto. So it's it's complicated to try to explain how, how these things work to Americans. <laughs> craftsmen. They're parallel to craftsmen. Yeah, I guess craftsmen. Although although I always thought that craftsmen was a little bit better. I'm not. I think I think you're right. I think now, <laughs> since now it's a Lowe's brand, I think now it's just the same as. I, actually, you know what? I find a lot of the manufacturing on the tools kind of like evened out. So I think the Snap-on stuff got worse, and the uh, Craftsman Mastercraft stuff got got better, and they kind of met in the in the middle. They're all like not the exact same quality, but the the spread between them is a lot smaller than it used to be. Absolutely, and the minute they make a semi deep. They'll sell. They'll outsell Snappy and Mac, no problem. Oh, for sure. So you went from you went. Sorry, McKen you went. You were a technician. You left, and then you went into um, uh, uh, wind. Uh, sorry, uh, wind turbine maintenance. What sure did? How does that jump feel like? Because I, I people that that don't work on cars don't understand. But there is no good brand of cars. They're all junk when they end up in your bay. <laughs> is that the same thing with wind turbines? No, it's it's a completely different world. Uh, I, working for the manufacturer, it was basically I'm only working with one brand, but they are they're stationary power plants. Everything is very very big, very very high, and very very heavy. So it's the adjustment is there, but actually troubleshooting it and servicing it is is so much easier than automotive in some ways troubleshooting a, a broken turbine is is so much simpler you have you, you have the schematics available they're very much bigger and larger but easy to navigate and if you if you have a troubleshooting mindset which you you pretty much have to to be in the automotive trade for a long time it, it's it's an easy easy transition it it, it served me well. I excelled quite quickly at troubleshooting down turbines and that became my movement through the company. I, I mean, pardon my oversimplification here, but in my mind, a turbine is basically a giant uh, rotor on the inside with a giant stator and a front bearing, a rear bearing, and a little bit of, you know, um, electronics. Is that? Do I have the gist of it? Am I like horribly wrong? On some, it depends on the manufacturer. That would describe closer to like an Entercon turbine. Uh, the ones that I work with, we have a, 
a very large rotor with three pivoting blades, multiple subsystems in the hub. And then you have a main shaft, usually with two bearings going into about a 60 ton gearbox and then a high speed shaft going back to your, to your generator. Wait, you guys have variable pitch in those blades? Yeah, that's how we control the speed of the rotor. Oh, very smart. I would just figured they would uh, draw more current and that would slow down the, the, the rotor. But I guess it makes sense that you using variable pitch. But those, I mean, those blades are massive. I've seen them on, on uh, transport trucks uh, stopping traffic here through Ottawa quite a few times. Yeah, we have much larger ones than that now. The larger ones haven't even shown up here. The ones in our area and your area are generally in the neighborhood of an 80-meter rotor, 40-meter uh, blade, maybe 100 at the most. Now we're at the 150-meter diameter mark, which are absolutely massive. The blades are transported uh, generally upright on the road systems because they can't go around corners. They're too long. So correct me if I'm wrong here. But generally speaking, a larger blade allows for um, more torque at lower speeds and therefore less, you know, rotating wear and tear. Is that is that about right? Uh, on ours, we it's a fixed speed. The rotor hits nominal speed. It always does the same speed. And you you adjust the pitch to capture the maximum amount of energy from from the wind and then the, the generator circuit changes that to outgoing power i may sorry i may have said it wrong i i guess i meant um the lower speed wind needed to get it turning is that is that yeah, about that's right, right. yeah yeah okay. the larger the larger your rotor the more energy you can capture from the wind is the basic the principle of it neat and what do you say to to um people like uh, certain politicians we won't name that think that uh these <laughs> these windmills are capturing the wind and the wind is what cools us down. So more windmills, more global warming. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> that's a fallacy for sure. But in, in our area here um, and, and in a lot of European areas, the population density is quite high. Now, Europeans generally have accepted wind turbines and get behind them for obvious reasons. Here in Ontario, not so much. Um, not my backyard symptom syndrome is quite prevalent here. And I think it's fine. I think it would it wouldn't be so fun to live somewhere where you didn't have a voice. So we have a lot of people that exercise their voice in Ontario. We do, we do. And our latest um, government here canceled our wind turbine plans, the ones we had near near my house, basically. Uh, and last I heard, you now I haven't verified this, so I have to be careful. But last I heard, they were actually tearing down the wind turbines that were already built and already generating electricity because they just nullified all the contracts. So I'm pretty sad about that. Yeah, that's criminal too. It's too bad, but uh, such is life. Yeah, <laughs> so it is. I feel pretty good about what I do for a day job. So I, I sleep well at night. It's, uh, it's fun and it's challenging and there's no limit. There's always something new every day. Do you have uh, do you have Banggood contacting you for sponsorship now and again? I see you have a lot of Banggood type products on your channel. Yeah, not anymore. Um, I found them to be difficult to work with, and I stopped accepting any products from them. They were one of those suppliers that would send you something, and before it even arrived, they want to know where their video was and expect high production quality <laughs> out of a twenty dollar part. So. I don't. Oh. I, I still buy products from them, but I don't. I don't accept anything for review from them. Yeah, that's not my experience with them at all. So I'm. That's that's sad that they treated you like that because, uh, for me, they've been really, really kind. And honestly, if you're sponsoring my channel, you know that video production is not um, is not of the utmost importance on my channel. So I'm really glad they've been easy to work with because I would do the same. I would I would dump them if they if they started to go get demanding like that but the reason i'm asking is they have a few um, little wind turbines like home wind turbines that work on 12 volts do you think that those things would be any good at all not likely no <laughs> yeah. the, the small turbines are difficult um, in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons the physics is hard on a small turbine the 
most of them are generally um, a small tubular similar to what you see on a full scale turbine. Those never work um, with the exception of one brand on sailboats that works half decent. But what you want is a very large diameter, one that looks like a big pie plate with the magnets and coils way out to the outside. So a very low tip speed generates really high speed cutting the the magnets cutting through the windings you have the your, your magnetic interrupt to the i'm just explaining that bad you want them really far out from the center of axis of rotation those style of turbines work well for home use but generally they're only homemade yeah what people need to need to understand from what you're trying to explain is that uh, it's not magnetic fields that uh, that generate electricity it's changing magnetic fields and the faster you can induce that change is the more uh, I think is more voltage you can create, and then the more wires you can do that change through at the same time is the more current you're going to create. I, I think I got that about right. Yeah, you got it much better than I was stumbling on. No, no, <laughs> it's go, fine. You know, there used it's, to be a site called OtherPower.com with a bunch of basically hippies in the bush in the around the world that were making these these handmade turbines out of brake rotors and hubs and setting the epoxying their own coils in and using the first of the neodymium magnets that that's if it's still up that's the site to go to for a homemade one and clone their designs they know what works yeah this is so green energy is a big um interesting thing to me uh because obviously we're suffering the the consequences of climate change already i mean uh, you seem a little bit older than than me but i'm early 30s and I, I cannot remember a summer that was as brutal as this one. And they're only going to get more prevalent. Like next year could be cooler, sure. But at some point, we're going to get an even worse one, an even worse one, and so on. Um, but the other thing is that typically green energy, if you reframe it, even the most like anti-green people can understand it. Why would you not want to be in charge of your own power? Why would you want to be beholden to someone else to bring you deliver you your power right like the the whole the, the whole thing is if you can generate your own electricity you are your own person like you are your own you know whatever so if you don't as ascribe to supporting societal living then you should be all in for green energy so i, I feel like it sort of can bridge divides between philosophies and on top of that i mean i I, I work very intermittently, like I work contract work as a professor. So, um, you know, energy that is free to me is just exciting. So I'm, I'm going all in. So if I can, if I can, you know, figure out how to design my own uh, wind turbine, that's probably something I'd want to try. Absolutely. A small, a small scale turbine and a small scale solar panel setup and some energy storage, like well, the Tesla wall made it super easy now, but you could make your own. You could do an off-grid pretty cheap and very effective and super reliable. Yeah, and one of my subscribers emailed me um, telling me where they get a whole bunch of 18650 cells for like extremely cheap. Uh, in fact, pretty much free. And it's incredible the potential because this person is right, like there is availability on recycled or reused cells. And that's what the big players do anyways. The, the big batteries used in EVs, people think once your electric vehicle is done, that battery goes to the scrapyard and gets destroyed, but it does not. What they do is they rip them out and they test the cells and the cells that are still good, but at lower capacity, they put them into giant banks and use that for green energy storage because in a car energy energy density is the most important you need to have as much energy for as little weight as possible but if you're talking about a building or like next to a power plant or something then energy density doesn't matter as much as energy capacity total capacity so what they do is they use these cells they build these massive battery banks and then that helps level the load on the lines so 18650 cells are and, and all sorts of lithium batteries are being recycled more than we think and I'm pretty excited for the prospect of basically um, you know energy storage 
that'll be extremely cheap because they'll be from discarded, you know, lithium batteries. I, I think that's great. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. I, I hadn't played with the 18650s enough in my in projects until uh, about a year or two ago. Is Quite simply, I drastically underestimated them. And uh, because I was into larger high power requirement stuff like the quadcopters, where at wide open throttle, I'm drawing 100 amps. They, they can't do that. But for for my iNav aircraft that can cruise at three amps, they're bloody perfect. And now it can fly for an hour on a four cell one P pack, which is just craziness when I'm buying them used out of Toronto from e-bike packs. And these things are like what you described. They were taken out of service because there was one or two bad cells in the pack. I'm getting them and I do a cap test on them and they're at 3,200 milliamp hours on them. 3.2 3.2 amp hours out of a used cell that I picked up for next to nothing. That's great. It, it's incredible, isn't it? And even uh, in Toronto, I know there's a bunch of salvaging companies that are are salvaging the the waste from the uh, those uh, hoverboard um, yeah. hoverboard crays. And those things have like something like uh, 12, uh, 14, or even like 20 cells in them, and people are picking them out of the trash. Uh, dumping the one bad cell and there's they're left with 19 cells like <laughs> it's great. incredible they're they're great and they the the ones that that fail well they fail it is what it is but the ones that last man they take a long time to degrade i'm i've flown the heck out of one of my four cell packs and it hasn't degraded at all that i can tell yet for two years so that's that's impressive. I can't get a lithium polymer pack to last me six months. No, and that's because they're completely different uses, right? The lithium polymer packs are for high punch and low durability, whereas the 18650s, um, they're trying to get as much as they can out of them, but mostly they're made for, you know, to be in long-term use. So, I mean, it is what it is. We we have a guy at work that has a, a battery impact gun that he's been using for last, the last four years. That thing goes on the charge every night. So if you figure five days a week uh, times 52 weeks times four years, uh, that thing did well over its 1,000 rated cycles and it had a hard life. It's still just fine. Yeah, it's great. It's a good time to be alive, isn't it? It is, absolutely. And, you know, I, I feel I feel relatively positive about the future. I know that I know that it's easy to feel all doomy and gloomy when you see you know, the, the news all the time and people resisting change. But I think we are coming to a point where most of us are sensible enough to know what's coming. And there are people like you and the industry you're working in and scientists and just normal citizens, makers. We, we all know what the problems ahead of us are. And I know I've met even just through the podcast, some extremely bright minds. So I think the future is in good hands. So I'm relatively positive about it. I'm with you. We have the technology. We have the know-how. We just need to implement it and get out of our own way and remove these artificial and corporate hurdles that uh, we lash ourselves down with. And pretty cool things can happen. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Do you have any um, any cool projects in the works that you may want to talk about? I uh, started over and over building a lithium-ion powered quadcopter, an S500, a large heavy lift quadcopter. I have all the parts here for a while. I uh, was going to make it a semi-autonomous full lithium-ion setup, but I keep failing at finishing it mostly because every time i go to live stream my live stream rig fails so i waste too much time fixing that Uh, i did this morning spent my funny money to order a whole whack of 20 gram or 20 kilogram servos for a robot project um I had a lot of fun when I did the robotic arm and I did a a brain interface with that. And that was pretty fun project. And I've seen these, uh, spot mini clone, uh, 3d printed robotic dog projects really picking up and seem to have hit critical mass. So I think I'm going to build one of those. 
that's pretty neat. I think it would be fun to add. Uh, most of the ones that they're doing are, are just strictly Arduino control and joystick control. And I'm already thinking this would be pretty fun to put a uh, Raspberry Pi uh, and do some machine learning and do some computer vision in it. I think that'd be a fun project. I've so. been imagining a robot arm, but instead of using servos, using stepper motors, but then a servo per joint to lock the joint once it's in position. So basically the servo would would draw no current to maintain. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, the uh, stepper motor would draw no current to maintain the joint in orientation. And it's just like it would be like basically uh, like a brake disc that would that would lock the position so that every time you give it a command to move, it would unlock, it would power up the, the stepper, unlock, move, lock, power down the stepper. And I think it's doable with that, like something like an ESP. It doesn't even have to be that powerful, probably doable with an Arduino. But I think that would remove a lot of the current requirements needed for a relatively heavy arm that can support all the servos, um, steppers, and the load that you put at the end of it. So that'd maybe one day I'll work on that. That'd be a fun project. You might even be able to start from the in-move arm framework. It has a lot of room in the forearm for for hardware and stuff. It might work out pretty good. Move arm framework. Yeah, it's the in-move. Um, Gael uh, is his name from France who designed it. It was basically when 3D printers first hit the scene. It was the first open source 3D printable robot. And it's the entire the entire robot top to bottom. I just did the arm. Um, he's a really cool guy too. I got talking to him a few times. Very neat. I'll have to look that up. This it's incredible that every maker I interview on this podcast, they send me into ridiculous amounts of directions. So it's like the, the spider web has just, has just grown so much. And uh, it, there's like there's no end to the possibilities of the maker movement. It's incredible. Agreed. It's it is overwhelming at times because the project list gets really long. But it is such a good problem to have. It's it's pretty fun. And in positions like we we've taken with sharing it on YouTube and sharing with the community, it's it's kind of fun that the hobby can be a little bit self-sustaining too. There's a little bit of channel funds come in from whatever projects and we put it right back into more fun things. Yeah. That's where, that's where I get my spending money. It'd be nice. Uh, it'd be nice if I could attack bigger things, but at the, at the moment, uh, funding is like a, a complete, a complete um, uh, roadblock. And it's not because I couldn't buy like, like I can, I can buy a laser cutter like it, it won't it won't bankrupt me but the the thing is i have no more space now i live in a tiny house about 1200 square feet and um it's like you know hobbies are like a gas they expand to fill any space you give it but at the <laughs> moment it's uh it's reaching critical mass it's pretty full here around here somebody should is that Boyle's law somebody should adapt that for hobbies yeah, I think uh, AVE, I think I'm actually quoting a AVE. He says, uh, <laughs> he said, yeah, hobbies are like a gas. You fill, fill every void. Yeah, I kind of miss the old school AVE videos. You know, it's just not the same these days. He was actually one of my earlier subscribers, believe it or not. Back when you could see everyone that was subscribed to you. And uh, I got talking to him a couple of times early on. I think I consulted on one of his projects. And I do miss his early videos. He He's a riot. Yeah, he seems like a great guy to, to hang out with because he's uh, pretty much, you know, because you were in the trades, but everyone who wasn't in the trades, that's kind of what your at least 30% of your coworkers are like. It, it, it's kind of <laughs> like that. Yes. 100 percent service calls out to the middle of nowhere yeah that's his videos are bang on <laughs> and the way he speaks he talks about his his customers or or whatever whoever's uh whoever's you know and and on top of that he seems very you know he seems like he leans very much uh one side uh, politically and then he says things like when he investigates accidents and how the safety concerns were not followed, and it seems counter to what to to what you think he's about. So basically, 
he is just a tradesman. Like he knows, like he, like you probably saw unsafe work practices in your, especially in the mechanic world. Um, and it's stupid because it doesn't even speed you up. Like it, it's ridiculous. Like these corners that are being cut are extremely dangerous and people do it all the time. And people, you know, people end up in, in the, uh, in the urgent care all the freaking time because they cut corners and oh. AVE is so right about that. We weren't even trained. I had to unlearn so much of the bad habits from the trade when I went to the wind turbine industry because safety is obviously a huge priority for many good reasons. But in the automotive trade, there was nothing. And even when I was in the college courses or or any of the curriculum, name any of it that centers around safety. Almost nothing. It's... It's a very poorly prepared industry. Absolutely. I had a, well, in trade school, I had a professor that, that claimed that uh, cigarettes are pretty good, but cigarettes uh, dipped in transmission fluid were even better. <laughs> it's like, it's, inc- it's just incredible. The, the blase attitude to, to safety in that, in that profession. Like how many people around your shop wore respirators when they were grinding, uh, when they were grinding steel, for example? Yeah, none and none were provided. I was actually the first first technician in my town to wear latex gloves, and man, did they make fun of me for it. Yep. And it wasn't it wasn't entirely because I knew the long term risks of the chemicals. I did. We all do, but that wasn't the motivator. The motivator was my hands were so beat up and always black that no matter what you've got that black under your fingernails and black in the calluses that it, it's can be slightly embarrassing on weekends so i started wearing gloves and that went away hey everyone look at eric he's got the bitch bittens on <laughs> yeah uh, oh <laughs> man it was never it was relentless i didn't care i get pretty thick in so I'm very lucky that uh, working in in a dealership, we took um, back in the old days. It's been bought out by new new ownership, and now it's a terrible workplace. But um, back in the old days, we used to um, we basically treated we were just a you know a low a regular you know regular car make. We didn't work. For, I didn't work for like a Mercedes or anything like that. But we treated every customer as if they paid 120 grand for their car, and so that's. Gloves, seat covers, um, you know, foot mats, everything. And if we get our, if we get our uniform dirty, like really dirty, we would we would change. Like you cannot keep working. You know, the floors were clean, the our work areas were clean. So early on, I had that in my mind that we have to keep everything clean and everything looking professional. So gloves were a normal part. But now as a professor all my students that come through and you know, I just, it's a habit. I wear nitrile gloves when I'm like wrenching. They're like, how can you work like that? How do you feel the bolts and stuff? I'm like, you know, you just, you get used to it. But still to this day, it's pervasive. Like the lack of safety equipment is real. Well, I look back on it and I still shake my head because like there wasn't even safety glasses hardly. There was safety glasses in the shop. They were an old pair on the bench that had been there for probably a decade. You can't even see through them. And I think I lost count at six times I had to go to the hospital, have steel ground out of my eyeballs in the time I was in the trade. That is just plain silly, but that was normal. Yep, it is. It, it was normal. Absolutely. We and had now, and twice, three times welders flash unknown how many stitches. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky actually for that. I only have one set of stitches. I severed a, um, a, uh, what are they called? I guess it's a, like a ligament or something in my, in my left hand, but it was totally like, it, it was totally an accident. I was tugging on a piece of washer fluid line and when it let go, my my hand went up and I hit my knuckle on the um, on the sheet metal under a hood. If people don't know, under the hood is like everything is sharp. Basically, anywhere a customer is not supposed to be, <laughs> yes. everything is razor blades. That's right. So yeah, I cut a uh, tendon. That's what it is. I, so I severed the tendon um, most of the way through, and that's the only stitches I got from my profession, which is incredible. Wow. Really, that's crazy. 
That's good. You were Escaped. smart with where you put your put your hands. Some people yeah. are just more clever than others about where they put their hands. I live by AVE's advice. Don't don't stick your pinky where you wouldn't stick your dinky. Yeah, he's bang on. It's it's true. And I tell my students too, and they laugh. But I'm like, don't laugh. It'll save you a finger one day. It will. Uh, time has actually flown quite a bit. Uh, I have a question that I ask every one of my um, guests, and I'd like to throw it to you if that's all right. Sure. So if you had you have a government grant to start the business of your dreams, um, just think unlimited money. Uh, it doesn't have to be profitable, but it does have to provide a service or a product. What kind of business would you start? Ooh, that's a tough one because I really do love my day job. But honestly, I think if I could, I always thought it would be great to expand sort of the path I'm on and what I started with the website, but make it so that I can not be an incubator, but basically help other people get their projects off the ground. Um, not, not for investment purposes, but even open source projects. If there was a way to, to do that, to, to get them either the materials or, or the, the help or connect them with people, I think that would be a really fun business to be in. And I think we could get some pretty cool ideas off the ground, which people are struggling with where they simply don't have the capital to even say buy a roll of 3D printer filament, let alone a printer. Something along those lines. Yeah, that's quite noble. I've always told myself that if I ever achieve sort of like Hacksmith, Linus Tech Tips, or like AVE levels of success, I would uh, I would throw it back to, uh, I would invest in in other probably YouTubers, to be honest, or people who publish their, their projects. Absolutely. And I think, I think your business idea is pretty much, pretty much that just bu businessified, you know? Yeah, I do it a little bit like I, not the business side. And I always take, I take a portion of the channel funds uh, and it goes to, I, I use Kiva, which is uh, investing in change on my website. And I, uh, it's actually an ongoing loan that you loan money out and then people pay it back for starting their own businesses and stuff, but it's micro loans. I, I've been doing that for oh, probably close to a decade now, but I think in moving that into the maker space or, or the area where, where we live with our YouTube channels, I think would be a, a real blast. I think with unlimited funds, I would probably want to make another YouTube now that I think about it. Like, because if, if Google pulls the plug, we're all done for like our methods of communicating, communicating our projects is like lost pretty much. We can, I mean, I'm on alternative platforms like Odyssey and uh, I, th I think BitChute is still around, but the discoverability there is nil is like yeah. none. Yeah, it's tough. I'm on Odyssey as well, and I've, I've actually debated doing a bit more short form content for platforms like TikTok, with have which have pretty good reach and a larger demographic of our age group now. But uh, I just I can't make the transition yet. I yeah, I, I have should, to though. say, yeah, old old dogs and new tricks for me. Like, ah, uh. <laughs> yeah, same. It's just. <laughs> I have enough trouble doing the footage for my projects now because I just want to build and then I'll get through and find out I didn't take any footage. So that entire project gets canned and never gets a video, which is a shame. So that'll be even worse with a new platform for me. I have to say your footage is pretty good too. I've been uh, hard-headedly sticking to the top-down Big Clive style camera, uh, but a lot of my um, my viewership is complaining about you know, it's hard to it's hard to see certain things and not all my my lighting is perfect and, and stuff like that. But I, I find your footage is is pretty good. But you do the whole uh, freehand in front of the camera type thing. How's that working out for you? Oh, it's it's hit and miss, right? I've always tried different formats and I did the same as you with the top down format with the mailbag videos and stuff for years. And the reason one of the main reasons I discontinued the mailbags was because I, I was stuck in that rut of always doing that format 
and always putting out that style. But sadly, I got way more views and way more engagement on those videos. When I canned them, it was, again, a, a disservice to the channel, but forced me to try new things. Yeah, and, and I don't, I guess I don't blame you because um, when you have, because like, let me, let me just be clear. You didn't really can them though. You moved them to Patreon, right? Yeah, not, not exclusively. Yes. Yeah. There, there are mailbags on Patreon, but it wasn't, it wasn't one for one. I don't, I don't do them as often for my patrons. I, I simply just don't take the footage unless it's something interesting or, or it's been a while since I've given something or engaged with my patrons. So, okay. Fair enough. It it was a move, but it wasn't a one-to-one move. So I was going to say when you post on Patreon, um, your, the signal to noise ratio is way better than just the general YouTube comments. I mean, it sucks to say like, cause some commenters are awesome, but you know, you get a lot of, you know, poorly thought out comments and uh, people who claim you're completely wrong and then they proceed to say the completely wrong stuff. So I can see why you would move something like that to, to Patreon because the, I mean, I've never had a negative, like, like a negative interaction with the patron, you know? No, no, they're amazing. And I'm really lucky that my patrons have been around a very long time. Most of them have been with me a decade. So it's, it's not, not, not necessarily on Patreon, but, but in YouTube in general, but on, on the comments, like, it's it can be really quite toxic on the main channel on the videos like for example this morning I, a video went live of a solder station review it's a 27 minute video that i put a lot of effort into that and i got one comment overnight and it was f you and your pcbs <laughs> because i have pcb way mid commercials of my own in there that was the uh, whole, only comment on the entire video, but 20 thumbs up or so already, but one comment and it was F you. I just shake my head sometimes. Let, let me tell you guys why um, people like Eric put commercials in their videos. This podcast is taking me a ridiculous amount of time to plan, to record, to edit, to upload, to advertise, to everything. And on every podcast episode, I earn just about 89 cents American. <laughs> okay, 89 freaking cents American. If I wasn't doing this for the love of doing it, I wouldn't be doing it. And that's why some people put commercials in their YouTube videos, because those things, I guarantee you, pay well more than 89 cents American. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the only reason I'm still doing this is is having some a little bit of money coming in from both Patreon and that Patreon almost covers my Adobe fees every month just to have a bloody video editor, just to have the editor, not necessarily learn how to use it well. Then I have then you have subscriptions like TubeBuddy, you have your other costs of your websites, your gear. It is. YouTube is not the place to make money. Nope. And people tend to take any adverts. I, I don't run mid roll ads either. I, I killed them the minute they came along and then had to kill them three more times before they stopped bloody popping back up. But, uh, without, without something it's, you'll go in the hole unless you're running maybe a freeware editor and no websites and no SEO tools of any kind in which case your reach would be so low, you'd get frustrated and quit probably. Yep. A hundred percent agree. Like, um, I don't, I'm not at the point of putting, um, commercials into my videos, but I do do, uh, sponsored videos. I do have PCB way. Um, I make, I make PCBs. I mean, to, it works for them and it works for me because I would be making PCBs anyways, and now I just make more of them and I, and I get a little bit of uh, channel support for, for them. I mean, it just, it is what it is. But at some point, I'll probably end up uh, experimenting with, uh, you know, adding video integration. I just don't know if I want to do it for PCB way per se, because there's just so much of it. But um, yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's a service I believe in, I don't see, I don't see any problem with that at all. 
yeah, over the years I've, I find this is a personal opinion only, but I've, I've grown to really, really enjoy my time with PCB way. They've, they've done well by me. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's enough that I know what's coming in and I know I can buy a component or two for a video and it's a relevant topic for our viewers like our, many of our viewers will make their own circuit boards at some time and pcb way does a great job easy to deal with they're, they're just wonderful and i've worked with several others uh, someday i'll do a video on why i work with them and why i show their little commercials it's they're they've been good to me yeah they've been good to me too but i can't uh I mean, we gotta we gotta cut this out because they're they're not sponsoring this uh, this podcast. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But honestly, I think I think if I did approach them and um, wanted to put some sort of ad integration into the podcast, I think they would be totally cool with it. But it's just not at that point yet. Exactly, you gotta coming do what's soon. right for your for your channel and your videos. That's right. It, it is coming soon. I feel like there's just there's just no choice because uh, this is a, a large investment. But for the moment. If I keep it ad free, I will. And if you guys are really um, wanting to keep it ad free, well, then uh, join my Patreon, but not unless you're already subscribed to Eric's Patreon. So <laughs> there we go. Why, thank you very much. So any uh, any closing thoughts? No, I'm really glad I got to join and I've enjoyed your, your podcasts uh, already and glad to be another one in the group. It's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I hope everyone can check out my channel, and I hope some of the people from my channel can come check out your channel. Well, I sure hope that the listeners are gonna at least go check you out. There is uh, tons of stuff that we didn't even talk about. I mean, one of his thumbnails has Chuck Norris on the on the thumbnail. You got it. You got to click something like that. It's just, <laughs> it is what it is. You know, I had got, to try that. I just yeah. had to. You got a you got a freaking out cat. You've got uh, Arnold. You've got some emojis. I mean, look, the, the the clickbait's all there, but the content is actually in there. So, you know, you got to go check this stuff out. So uh, check out the links in the video description or in the podcast notes. Or if you're on YouTube watching, you can just check out the links that are on the background here. And I want to thank you, Eric, one more time for joining me today. It was I really appreciate it. It was a really good conversation. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, and make sure you go subscribe to Eric's. I think he's got four channels. Check the links in the description anyways, and uh, we will catch you in the next one. Thanks for listening.